It's six o'clock in London. It's 1 p.m. in New York, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid Livestream, Series 12, Episode 3. That is no fewer than Episode 69 starts here. Well, first of all, let me say it was fabulous last week to be in London. Uh, as you know, we recorded a great show with Ivan Steria from the Macedonian Stock Exchange, although he was, of course, all the way back in Macedonia at the time. We were in London for the AFM conference. It was an absolutely fabulous 23rd annual conference at the Danubius Hotel in Regent's Park, London, just beside the great home of cricket, Lord's Cricket Ground. I had the honor of being the opening keynote speaker, and it was a delight to be there along with a panoply of notable speakers. Thank you also to my fellow panelists, Will Mitting, Haranda Misra, and Chakapa, Chakapan Tarashirai of the Thai Future Exchange. And thank you to the organizers, Christy Cash. Pat Kenny, Paul Constantino. It was a brilliant hybrid conference. All I can say is I'm really looking forward to seeing so many more of our South African colleagues and our colleagues from Asia at the next AFM event, Face to Face. Unfortunately, the AFM conference got off with a little bit of sad news. We have had the world of exchanges enduring a torrid quarter with the deaths of great names, Brian Taylor, Chris Pryor Williard, and now, alas, Otto Negley. We published a tribute to Otto Negley, and you can read that on LinkedIn and Medium. Otto was really a very, very special man. He was perhaps best known for his stewardship of Suffix, the Swiss Futures and Options Exchange. He was also later the chairman of the Swiss Futures and Options Exchange. And of course, he was one of the people who was instrumental with Jörg Franke in the merger of Suffix into Deutsche Terminbörse to create Eurex, the continental European powerhouse futures exchange to this day, where he served as deputy CEO from 1998 to 2001. It was an illustrious career. He made such an impact across the world, both the emerging markets and the established markets, all with that delightful Swiss accent at all points in time and a cheery countenance. I can well remember sitting in the Turkish Airways lounge at Istanbul Airport when we were both waiting to fly back to Zurich after a great phase conference as I was leaning over to get myself a piece of sacker torch for that is, of course, my want to have something chocolate at all points in time. There he was already at the demo cake stand enjoying his Turkish coffee, a beer and indeed a cake. What ensued was one of those magnificent flights. Otto was a character. Whether he was the chairman of the CME Europe Clearinghouse or in any of the other multiplicity of positions he occupied, he was a titan of the exchange industry. We knew he was very, very ill in recent months. But frankly, that doesn't make it any easier, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Otto. Farewell, my friend. Last week, on a happier note, I discussed the magnificent seven. We were looking at the top seven salaries in the parish of exchanges. That included, of course, Terry Duffy, Adina Friedman, Jeff Sprecher, Leo Lesky, Nicholas Agassin, Hard Lutnick, and Ed Tilly. All of those people earned more than $10 million for their efforts with the leading exchanges in the world last year. A very elegant chart to boot. Wonderful infographic from the team there. Those stories as well were on LinkedIn and Medium. Now, today, we've published an update. So, from the Magnificent Seven, we move on to what I've termed the Ocean's Eleven. The Ocean's Eleven this year are not picked because they are the 11 next highest earners. They simply happen to be some very interesting people that we thought it was interesting to compare on a data basis. So welcome to the Ocean's Eleven, David Schwimmer of the LSE, Theodore Weimer of the Deutsche Börse, Rich McVeigh of Market Access, Lobin Lobin Chai of Singapore Exchange, Akira Kyoto of the Japan Exchanges Group, Stefan Bujna of Euronex, Peter Jackson of the New Zealand Exchange and Leila Furry were amongst those who were chosen for the Ocean's Eleven. It's not a scientific listing of the next group of CEO salaries, but nonetheless makes for interesting reading. You can find that on Medium and LinkedIn. And of course, it's already been published in the watercolor of the Boris business, Exchange Invest, which you can get daily to your inbox and join. In fact, the Magnificent Seven and the Ocean's Eleven, who are daily readers and subscribers to precisely that newsletter. 
Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is an old friend, Max Butty. Max Butty is a man who's developing digital assets these days. Massimo has worked for investment banks, prop trading firms, market makers, and exchanges in trading product and market development, cooperating closely with buy side and sell side traders, analysts, and portfolio managers, and helping create markets and strategies to support them. Nowadays, he's working for SDX, the Swiss. And that D is not for derivatives, ladies and gentlemen. Uh uh, it's for digital. The Swiss Digital Exchange, where he leads the equity team dedicated to enhancing the funding process for private companies and improving the issuance, custody, and transfer of digital securities in SDX's regulated CSD. Prior to SDX, Massimo spent well, an illustrious career with all manner of names, including seven years at the London Stock Exchange Group as head of equity derivatives markets and global account director developing key strategic group accounts, amongst many other positions. Max, greetings. Welcome to IPO Vid Livestream. Where in the world are you today? Good evening, Patrick. Uh, I am in Zurich at our offices uh, in, uh, in the fashionable Zurich West. And uh, if you allow me, I just wanted to uh, pay tribute to Otto Negeli uh, because, as you know, I started off at Sofex when Sofex launched. And uh, uh, in no small part, uh, uh, people like me and people of my generation owe their careers to uh, people like Otto. So he will be sadly missed. He was a visionary. He was an innovator. And... Uh, in, and I like to think that uh, in, in Switzerland, uh, we are still innovating and uh, we're still pushing forward innovation in financial markets and in capital markets. And uh, uh, SDX is uh, perhaps an expression of that, uh, of that vision. Well, there you go, Max. Doing something in Otto's name is always a good thing. I think one of the things that's great about Otto was he was such an innovator. He was such an advanced thinker, but he just always appeared like such a reasonable guy. I mean, he was the man you were happy to have a beer with at the same time as you were happy to have a high level technological architecture meeting or a management meeting or a product meeting. He really, really was a super character all around. Yes, indeed. And uh, uh, and again, uh, I think that uh, he embodied this uh, this Swissness in business, being reasonable and being innovative, but uh, being also uh, uh, ready to plant your feet firmly on the ground. And uh, uh, I guess that this is a little bit the, the premises around uh, around SDX. And I know you're gonna you're gonna ask me more about about this. Is is there anything in particular you want to know? Well, Let's, with that. On that, let me say, ladies and gentlemen, if you've got any questions you'd like to know about the Swiss Digital Exchange, now's the time to ask. We've got one hour with Max Buddy. We've got 52 minutes to go precisely, and it will be lovely to receive your questions or indeed a little bit of love if you'd like to give us some encouragement so that we can get this up the artificial intelligence rankings. Let me just say also before I go back to Max, good evening, Peter. I hope you're on the sofa with Ari this evening. I hope all is well in your world. It's lovely to see you once again. Thank you for joining the show. Hello, Liam Moore as well. Great to see you, Liam. Thanks very, very much for being such a regular viewer. If you've got a question, of course, we will look forward to them whenever you wish to ask them. So let me, I mean, kick that off. SDX, first of all, I suppose you've hit on a couple of words which I think are quite interesting because you've talked about already, well, in the name of Otto, being innovative. And in fact, the Swiss exchange being innovative, which I think is absolutely true. But it's not necessarily something that people who, I suppose, are used to the caricature of Swissness might necessarily wake up to in the morning and think, oh, that's inimitably Swiss, Max. Well, that's, uh, that, is, that is true. But again, and, but it's also a little bit stereotypical. And, uh, and I think that like in all stereotypes, there is a grain of truth. Uh, as I said before, uh, uh, in Switzerland, the, the, the business philosophy is uh, to look forward and uh, to use the best tools available uh, to make sense of the new world, but also to, to, to really uh, bring, bring a better way of doing things to, uh, to, um, uh, to the capital markets and to finance in, financial services in general. And uh, that that translates, for, for example, in being particularly attentive in, uh, in market infrastructure, in the way markets operate, in creating accessible and fair markets. Uh, and uh, 
uh, I think that uh, uh, when uh, the uh, the DLT technologies started to come to the fore in in finance uh, about uh, eight nine years ago, uh, as a technology tool, uh, the Swiss market uh, started to uh, to to take notice and started to wonder and started to look at how they could uh, could use this technology to to improve and innovate. So uh, the awards you're referring to, I guess, are uh, for uh, two milestones that came out of that thinking and came as a consequence of the launch of, uh, of SDX. Um, one was because SDX uh, is a regulated uh, exchange and a regulated CSD, the first one of its kind in, in the world. And uh, the uh, second uh, was uh, because we uh, were... Oh, in November last year, the first uh, uh, exchange to list a bond, a traditional bond in full digital format, in, na in native digital format. What that means is that that, uh, that bond uh, replicates uh, and mirrors the characteristics of, uh, uh, of, a, of a real bond, but it exists only as a cryptographical uh, rendition uh, it, it is deposited on a node and uh, is, uh, it's not dependent on any piece of paper whatsoever. Uh, it runs on uh, uh, DLT lines, so uh, distributed ledger technology rails. That means that every time a transaction happens on that bond, uh, all the wallets uh, that we still call accounts in, in our environment connected to our network are updated at the, at the same time. So you have this immediacy uh, of, uh, of, um, of information, transparency, uh, and uh, you have uh, something that we call or atomic settlement, which is basically a instantaneous settlement of that transaction uh, on that bond. Uh, which is clearly a, uh, a step forward uh, compared to uh, the, the current settlement uh, cycles of, uh, of exchanges. It eliminates counterpart risk, potentially. Uh, it also creates uh, new challenges for, uh, for custodians uh, and for, uh, for payment agents. Uh, but uh, it is a new way to adopt technology uh, to to innovate and to propose something, something, uh, something different. The objective is uh, to going forward uh, use the same technology to list more assets, make more assets available, uh, open up the variety of assets listed on uh, on uh, on our CSD, uh, make the process easier, but also on the long on the long run use this technology to lower the cost of maintenance, cost of access, uh, cost of maintaining positions on exchange, but also cost to distribute information and uh, to make operational decisions and risk management decisions uh, in, um, in financial markets. Very interesting. Let's just unpick that for a second. When you're talking about this instantaneous or atomic settlement, what's the actual lag time and how long it takes to settle a transaction? Well, the, uh, we always say that uh, the, the transaction and the settlement are, uh, for intents and purposes, the same thing is not entirely true. There is a time lag, a time lag that uh, uh, could vary between minutes, uh, seconds and minutes. This is how, how, how fast it is. Certainly, it's very interesting. It, it undoubtedly reduces uh, 95, 98 percent of all the possible risks that you get in between. Um, yeah, fascinating altogether. And certainly that was an amazing, amazing first issue that you had with the bond. We have a question here, which, which uh, well, what will regulated six SDX do, says HB, against such an evil unregulated crypto markets, mostly run by bucket shop like broker dealers listing 99.9% .9 unregulated and unregistered securities. Is the clue in the question there, Max? Well, uh, that's that's a that's a very uh, that's a very good question. I won't be dragged into a polemic on, on, on this. No, jokes aside, um, 
what we do is in it, it, being regulated and uh, and what we do is at the essence uh, of eliminating the uncertainty and eliminating the uh, the um, the opacity uh, connected to these uh, uh, to these less stable participants uh, in the market. However, I must say one thing is that we don't have to conflate and confuse two things. The crypto market uh, and these unregulated exchanges and uh, and um, and brokers, uh, broker dealers out there um, are not in the same space we are. And also they do not uh, trade and list the same assets we do. For all intents and purposes, we are a very traditional exchange. We... Um, we translate in digital format traditional securities, bonds, shares, uh, certificates. Uh, we use digital representations of these uh, uh, ownership rights and, uh, and economic, economic rights. We use the technology to transform them into, to transform these, these of securities into digital securities, but we are not in the market, uh, in the cryptocurrency market. We are not uh, into the NFT space. Uh, we are not in the most exotic uh, areas of uh, DeFi. Um, our role is very much to, uh, uh, and going back to, to the Swiss philosophy, to adapt something traditional, use a new technology and start uh, uh, leveraging on the benefits of the technology, uh, bring stability, bring order. Um, we, we decided to be a regulated exchange. It was a choice. It was a very long process. Uh, clearly, uh, you, you can imagine uh, we, we had to, to go through from scratch, from a, uh, a, uh, the start through the regulatory approval with, uh, with the Swiss authorities, with FINMA. We were not grandfathered, although we are part of a large uh, traditional exchange group, six, uh, with its own uh, regulatory licenses. We were not grandfathered. We started from the uh, from the uh, from scratch, and we wanted to achieve regulatory approval exactly to start addressing, not uh, solve the problem, boil the ocean, and do it all in one go, but start addressing one of the main problems that uh, people have with digital securities, which is again. Com conflating cryptocurrencies with everything else that is digital, and also uh, provide regulatory stability uh, and visibility and transparency to all the uh, institutional investors who want to, uh, to access these products. And again, we, by choice, started by uh, um, tackling institutional, institutional investors. Uh, our products are available uh, to to uh, expert investors. They are not retail products. They come with very strict uh, uh, requirements in terms of, of access. And, and again, it's by choice because we want to build markets that are stable on the long term. We want to build confidence in these products. We want to uh, take small steps towards a point where we can really start democratizing markets and democratizing access to securities. So that's very interesting. You want to democratize the access to securities and so on, but what you're doing is you're starting by building an institutional only market. Yes, because we think that that is uh, uh, perhaps the best, the best way to then get to uh, the, uh, the uh, bringing digital, digital securities to the masses, if you want. But we think we think it it's it's better that way because it brings confidence because uh again we we chose to do that although it was hard it was harder we could have been unregulated and be out there uh competing for uh, a different kind of a completely different kind of business but it wouldn't have been what we what we wanted to do what it was in the in the intention as uh, again uh, we 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 decided to do to do this because it's a challenge not because it's easy 
certainly a very interesting challenge. And of course, it's something that goes very, very well with the Swiss environment, given the hefty amount of buy side institutions, the banks and all of the money that funnels through the, the Swiss marketplace. So far, explain to me, what's the interest actually been like in terms of building the market? Has it all been coming from Switzerland or are you seeing a lot of international interest? Right. Uh, the uh, We have uh, a, uh, a lot of support in Switzerland, as you would expect. Uh, we uh, all our uh, all our members our founding founding members uh, are, are Swiss banks. However, uh, two weeks ago we admitted uh, the first uh, non-Swiss member, um, CM CM Equities from Germany, who will be um, who, who will be a, a full member of the exchange with a full member of the exchange and of the CSD. In terms of uh, of issuances. Um, we have uh, a fairly uh, solid uh, interest from abroad. However, again, because we wanted to start small, uh, our regulatory uh, our regulatory uh, remit at the moment allows us only to list companies that are domiciled in Switzerland. So we had to. I wouldn't say that we had to turn away business, but unfortunately, we had ver some some very uh, interesting conversations that led to the point where we 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 couldn't take the listing in because uh, we have we have uh, we 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 decided to start to start small and then start uh, uh, expanding in the future. But we had a lot of interest from uh, from abroad, especially by by foreign based issuers. Very interesting. So talking about that issuance piece, I mean, you're the head of digital equities, if I understand it, or at least the Swiss Digital Exchange's head of equities. Tell us a little bit about that role, Max. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's an interesting role because uh, uh, it goes back to my roots in, uh, in product development. Uh, and, you know, Patrick, you and I met about, oh, my God, 20 years ago, uh, while uh, uh, we were developing single stock futures, uh, which were uh, probably as much your baby as mine and and uh, and uh, John Foyles and all the all the uh, the uh, the members of the parish uh, that you you very often talk about. Um, so it goes back to that. It's a lot about uh, uh, using products to solve pain points and uh, and again. Uh, what are we going to do that is going to give us a, 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 um, a, a step change in the market in terms of adoptions? So it implies a lot of, uh, it involves a lot of, uh, of education, uh, a lot of work explaining what uh, the, the advantages are uh, of these technologies, why the approach is different. And uh, we are focusing predominantly on, uh, on private markets. Which again, for me, is a, then is a bit of a departure because I've always been in uh, in uh, in, uh, in secondary public markets, uh, so very liquid, very liquid products or uh, or products that traded in in a different way. Here is a completely different uh, world for me. Uh, it's uh, very liquid, uh, very liquid products. Uh, it's more about providing a service than uh, than than price discovery on an exchange, although we are looking at developing some secondary liquidity uh, in, uh, in private markets. Uh, however, my, ex my, experience, my past experience in building liquidity in products, in, uh, in building market structures that are conducive to uh, building liquidity, uh, it's, it's coming very handy, uh, put it this way. So uh, I have a phenomenal team uh, based in Zurich, um, incredibly driven, incredibly, uh, incredibly innovative, incredibly young as well. <laughs> so uh, they make up on energy uh, uh, for you know when I when I flag. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's again it's a mixture for me of old skills and a steep learning curve. Um, I also realized that in terms of uh, of, uh, of digital securities, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhat considered one uh, one of the uh, of the old of the old guys in securities. I remember my first being involved in my first project in way back in 2015 uh, at the London Stock Exchange, which is only 
seven years ago, but in, in digital terms is eons uh, in terms of where the product was, what we were doing, what we were thinking about, uh, how we were looking at this and how it is now. So, uh, but it's always a learning curve and, and, and also, again, uh, being challenged, I think it really keeps your brains active and, uh, and, and keeps, your, uh, keeps you on your toes. Very interesting point. Yes, I think actually we can safely say, although please don't sue me, Johnny, but seven years in the crypto markets is basically the equivalent of dog years partying with Johnny Depp. It's certainly <laughs> something along those lines. It, it's quite an incredible, it's an eon, an age in one thing. And yeah, 20 years ago, there we were building single stock futures on the life exchange. Wasn't that great fun? It, it really was great fun to be the advisor to the exchange at that point in time, because yes, I've been advocating for those things from the mid 90s and everybody thought I was completely bonkers. Although the good folks of Hong Kong exchanges, well, Hong Kong Futures Exchanges, it then was independently with Mark Bedison. All of that team had actually introduced them before that. And I thought it was a fascinating innovation. And well, they're still around to this day and going strong, which is good to see. Let's hope the same can be said in the digital, digital marketplace world. Thank you, HV, for your question. Um, you made a comment. You've also added a, another question. That's very interesting. I'm going to run this question past you, actually. Now, Max is the head of equity. So to be fair, might not be exactly your thing and you might not want to give away what's happening in the future. But would SDX also think of listing dematerialized commodities like electric energy, cloud space, CPU or blockchain timestamping services, all tokenized and stably defined as commodities must be? The answer is yes. And uh, we have uh, uh, a whole uh, department and a whole team uh, led by my dear friend, uh, Michele Curtoni, who looks at uh, new products, new innovation, new innovative products, uh, new asset classes. Uh, uh, and uh, definitely uh, these are things that uh, uh, we consider. Uh, we have a very strict uh, uh, process uh, with which we process new ideas and uh, but we are an agile company, so considering uh, on a continuous cycle new products, new things to do uh, is, is part, of our, part of our DNA. Uh, we, uh, we have a process where we, we, we fill, we kill ideas all the time. We decide whether we're going to go ahead. Most of them don't make it to uh, pass the ideation stage uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, the answer is yes. I mean, cons we would definitely consider any ideas uh, and uh, any any asset class that might have a future and might benefit from from um, from our infrastructure. Yes, benefiting from your infrastructure, and obviously you've got that great Swiss brand and the overall Swiss infrastructure behind you, which I'm sure is a huge boost of confidence for everybody, given the membership and the, and the controlling interest, for example, in the Swiss exchange that comes from your shareholders being all of the banks of Switzerland, essentially, but clearly the major two and others. So tell me a little bit more if we unpack. Thank you, HV, for your questions. Incidentally, very, very interesting to hear from you all together. Much appreciated. If you've got a question, we're here discussing with Max Butti, delivering digital assets. He's the head of equity at the SDX, the Swiss Digital Exchange, which is an arm of six, the Swiss Exchange. So tell me one thing, Max. I mean, you're talking about the fact you're concentrating on private markets overall. And it's a little disconcerting because you seem to have disappeared here. Somebody maybe lost a button in production. Oh, there you are, Max. Good to see you again. Sorry, quite worried for a second that maybe we'd lost you somehow or other. So you're looking at private companies in terms of what you're doing in terms of their fundraising. So is that predominantly about equity raising or is it bond raising or equity raising or is it simply whatever the client wants to do? Uh, well, it's it's clearly is we we respond to client needs and 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 client client request um at the moment uh, in the equities world at sdx we have uh, a uh, a public market a uh, a normal uh, market where you can list when you you where you can ipo companies 
And, but as you said, we also building private markets because we think that uh, DLT technologies can deliver a step change in, in private markets. Private markets are incredibly um, inefficient. They're incredibly fragmented. Uh, everything is difficult. There is a lot of attrition, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of points of friction uh, between different processes and different actors with these processes. Uh, by adopting uh, DLT technologies, we, we think we can, uh, we can smooth out the process and basically take companies uh, in their funding journey uh, through our, uh, through our, um, our infrastructure. Ideally, what we would like to do in an ideal state, and this is what we're building towards, is to build an ecosystem that can support private issuance of shares from day one, from the day of the co companies incorporated, all the way through to IPO. So if you think about the, the funding journey, typical funding journey of a company, you have, you know, pre-money, then you have seed angel investors of, uh, or FFF, friends, families, and fools who believe in the idea. Uh, and then going forward, you have your A rounds, B rounds, uh, C rounds, and then you go to IPO. Now, that process at the moment, I described to C round, uh, is, uh, is very complicated. Uh, documentation has to be written all the time. Uh, capital increases are very time consuming for the founders and the managers of companies who are actually more uh, involved in, in, they should be more involved in growing their businesses than running after uh, placing memorandums and so on and so forth. Uh, so in certain of these companies, the young companies need CFOs and, and, uh, and, and, um, and, and an entire staff to support their funding process. So what we want to do, we want to deliver the tools to make that better. So by, by listing a, uh, a, a company on day one, uh, issuing native digital securities on SDX, what do you get? You get a security that is recognized uh, under uh, Swiss law as an intermediated security, i.e. a bankable security, a, a, a security that is immediately in, embedded into the, banking, into the banking system. We give you an icing code, something that normally you wouldn't get. From that moment on, uh, we, have, uh, we have custodian banks who will take your shares and, uh, and deposit them into the accounts of, the, of your investors. Next time you need to uh, carry out a... a a capital increase, everything is already digitized, all the information is already available, all the, uh, all the accountants, all the, uh, all, the, all the consultants who work uh, on the placement can, can find uh, all the uh, digitized uh, trail of information. All the records are immutable. Uh, that's one of the beauties of this technology. As I said before, everything is updated in uh, in quasi real time. Uh, all the uh, nodes of the network are updated at the same time of any of any transaction of any changes. Um, and on the back of that, we want to create also, uh, as I said before, some sort of secondary liquidity to facilitate not only fundraising but also partial exits. We want to uh, start looking at helping companies to uh, hold ad hoc liquidity events where they bring in new investors without necessarily uh, issue new, new equity, but just exchanging it. Uh, one area where we want to focus is the, is the one of uh, um, share incentive schemes uh, for employees. There are a, a very powerful retention tool to retain talent in growing companies. Um, they, they they go from the classical uh, uh, the classic uh, option uh, employee option schemes ESOPs to uh, different structures like phantom shares for example uh, when you have uh, an employee who would like to monetize some of that or uh, you want to reward them after years of uh, of, of loyalty allowing them to uh, bank their shares 
we want to create a, a, a possibility to create secondary markets for them so they can participate and they can they can have a transparent process on which to monetize these uh, these uh, these um, these shares and this and uh, and these options and the the focus on on pri on on private markets is also based on a simple observation as you know the trend in the last 15 years has been that companies stay private longer uh, there are less uh, less ipos worldwide the trend is down uh, companies uh, uh, tend to develop a lot more value while private than than in the past and there is no efficient way to service that growth Point in case in the Swiss market, uh, last year uh, there were two IPOs of two Swiss companies uh, um, on, on shoes uh, listed at NASDAQ and, um, and uh, Sport Radar uh, listed on, on NYSE. Those companies were private for one for 10 years, the other one for 21 years. So uh, imagine, just imagine uh, the, the, uh, the uh, maintaining a company of that, they both IPO at a valuation of seven and a half billions. So they're not small companies. Can you imagine the infrastructure you have to have while you're growing your business uh, to maintain that level of involvement with your investors, with your bankers, uh, with your custodians, with, with the, the whole ecosystem who contributes to that? So. We are focusing on that because we think that there is a real, uh, a real application of uh, of DLT technologies to solve those problems and make life easier for issuers, but also for investors. Because if we can enlarge investors' base, we can create new opportunity sets for them. So actually, that's fascinating. Let me ask you one specific question, because you've mentioned the fact that you can essentially do the whole life cycle of funding. Essentially, you can join your exchange as a very small entity and you can grow from startup to a mighty acorn. And then you could even take the great leap into the unknown and become a publicly listed security as well. So there's no real minimum size at which you need to be in order to, to get on to the SDX at the lower end? In theory, no. In, in theory, no, uh, there is no uh, no sides. You could you could list a company uh, when if you uh, you can list a company uh, right after the uh, the uh, the, um, the the creation. You need you need an issuer agent clearly, uh, which is one of our members typically. Uh, but beyond that, there is no basically no other. Okay. Uh, no other barrier. Clearly, it has to make economic sense for yes, for, of for companies to to do that. And uh, uh, but yes, that's the that's what we're aiming. That's what we're aiming at. So clearly, I mean, there are criteria in terms of you want to encourage future growth stocks. You want to get companies that are going to grow rapidly, and therefore you're not looking at the next uh, mom and pop store in Opficon or something in order to come to your market. We, we get that. That's obviously a, a logical sense of priority. How about as companies issue their equity along the way? Does that mean that you have a lot less paperwork actually generated because it's an exchange related process. Let me give you a specific example. The private markets in America have an issue because if you've already done say seed series A, B, C, by the time you get to series D, suddenly you're carrying this pan fold of paper, which is about the same height as, as your eyes head around with you with all sorts of different coders and criteria and so on. Does that become alleviated within the SDX environment? Yes. And uh, actually, uh, you know, we tend to we, we, we tend to validate this kind of, of things with our with our potential clients and with our uh, with our potential users. And uh, and again, this, there are two discussions that actually were, were really, uh, I would say, they, they helped us really focusing on this and which were Two, uh, two discussions we had with two fintech CEOs uh, separately, but one was going through uh, the, uh, a, a capital increase and uh, it took them, uh, and they 
already had, as you described, three different share classes. Uh, they had uh, uh, preemption rights. Uh, they had different uh, different um, uh, shareholder agreements in place. And at a certain point uh, last year, they were going for a, uh, a C round, and they decided to 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 basically optimize that and 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 basically collapse all the different. Uh, the different uh, share categories into one and so on and so forth. And uh, at the same time, raise fresh capital. Uh, they had a very successful uh, capital raise, uh, but the whole process took six months. The CEO uh, spent tens of thousands of uh, Swiss francs uh, in, uh, in legal fees. And at the end, uh, uh, he was left with uh, uh, a pile of, of 980 pages on his desk. Um, so when when we discussed this, we we rapidly started to think that perhaps we could do a little bit better than that. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, he agreed wholeheartedly and uh, uh, is probably one of the companies that we will we are looking forward to uh, welcome on on our exchange. Uh, the other one, while we were validating some of the business plans, had already done that, had already set up his company in a way that it can be uh, tokenized. And under Swiss law, uh, a company that can uh, issue intermediated securities, which can go on to a CSD. And he reckons that uh, he's going to be saving hundred, hundreds of thousands in the next uh, three to four years as it moves through the different funding rounds. So the answer is the evidence that we see by talking to the CEOs of some of these companies, of fast growing companies, is that there is a real benefit. So mm -hmm. we, we are delivering value. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I really do think there's an amazing sales opportunity in there because there's so much demand for SNE equity for growth equity, equity at every stage, and particularly right across, even if we just take narrowly Europe, the, there is so much of an opportunity. And given the fact that the European Union, obviously beyond the shores of Switzerland per se, have talked so much about the capital markets union that delivered so relatively little, there's still a huge growth disparity there, particularly given the, the differences in equity culture between the European markets and, and the US traditionally and so on. But if you can compress the feeds, that, that starts to become really, really interesting and compress the time to market, that becomes hugely advantageous as well. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, we're discussing developing digital assets with Max Butty. He's the uh, head of equities at the Swiss Digital Exchange. Let me just say a hearty hello to Simon Huckle. It's lovely to see you. Good evening to you, Simon. Thanks very much for joining the show this evening. If you've got a question for Max, ladies and gentlemen, then you have got, well, not much more than 10 minutes to actually start getting in there and asking your question. If you want to know something Something about the Swiss Digital Exchange or developing digital assets. So, Max, you mentioned briefly all about this very interesting methodology. You've got this, let's call it instantaneous settlement, but we all know that what is actually instantaneous always has a little blip of a delay, but it's certainly a lot better than T plus whatever it is, 34,000 seconds, which is T plus two days. How does that work in terms of how you've been able to interact with the existing custodial landscape? Because you mentioned you've got your own settlement CSD built into the platform, yeah? Yes. Uh, is, a, is a brand new infrastructure. So we, uh, the, uh, we maintain the nodes uh, in behalf of our, uh, of our custodians. The custodians had to uh, basically set up a new infrastructure whereby they, uh, they have access to our, uh, to our nodes. Uh, we could potentially also have distributed solutions where uh, the custodians maintain the, uh, the nodes themselves. It's a different setup. Uh, it has to be uh, one thing. It has to be said is that we are what it what what in in the parlance is called a walled community, a walled garden. Uh, we are not a uh, a public chain 
uh, we have our own private uh, our own private solution it it is also one of the basis of of our uh, of our regulatory uh, um, approval. Uh, so, at the moment, uh, it is a a, um, a an infrastructure uh, that uh, is brand new. So, our members uh, who have been very supportive have gone through a uh, have also through a, a very steep uh, learning curve in order to uh, connect. And conform to this uh, to um, to this infrastructure, uh, but uh, again, the at the moment we maintain all we maintain all that. One day, perhaps, uh, you know, who knows? We might we might open it to to a public to a public chain, but then it would be a different exchange. It would be a different a different a completely different proposition. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, philosophically, because there's been this amazing drive for ultra transparency, one might say, through having utterly public blockchains, but then they've all run into the same sorts of security problems along the way, despite the immutability of, of the blockchain as they've gone. So therefore, you've gone for essentially a private, as you say, a walled garden solution. Therefore, presumably, the information is spread amongst a series of participants, but essentially it's still a centralized blockchain that's controlled by SDX? That is correct, yes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's a lot of people who can observe what's going on, but the final say or what is finally done actually falls to the exchange in the middle in order for it to actually sign off and agree to whatever that movement or transaction is. Is that correct? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, like in a traditional exchange, our members uh, sign up to our uh, our uh, our, uh, our rules and regulations, our terms and conditions. Uh, they agree to perform certain certain actions. Uh, they uh, they can decide the permissions uh, that they have on the network uh, and uh, who can do what on the different nodes. Um, but again, they they have to conform to our uh, our tech our tech technical standards and uh, to our operational operational standards so they have to maintain uh, operations in a certain in a certain way in accordance to our to our rules so in that sense it's not different from a traditional exchange yes i think that's a very interesting point but obviously then you're bringing with you the security of how that works Okay, so let's change gear and, and just pop back a moment because we were talking about product. You just piqued me with a, with a thought about the technology there. We're discussing developing digital markets with the SDX's head of equities, Max Butty. So Max, when you look at your exchange and when you look at the user base and so on, you mentioned the fact that your members obviously are essentially the same members as you find from the, the Swiss exchange. So therefore you're representing a huge cadre of Swiss and therefore international banking. What has the response been like so far to your offering from sort of the traditional buy side players? Well, they're certainly they're certainly interested, especially uh, the the buy side uh, players who are more into that, uh, in, more into private markets. And they are looking more at private equities as a as an asset class or as a way to, in a certain way, decorrelate returns with with some of their other portfolios. Uh, so they've been they've been very interested. Uh, clearly, VCs are interested uh, because it helps them developing portfolios that are more uh, uh, consistent in terms of uh, uh, of data. Uh, we 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 have a lot of conversations, for example, about uh, establishing uh, establishing valuation services for these companies who are clearly uh, private, so more difficult to evaluate. Uh, so there is an opportunity that uh, opportunity on on that. Uh, but um, we are building all these services around all these bits and pieces of the ecosystem uh, in order to uh, to service exactly this type of uh, of investors um, the buy side uh, uh, again has an interest because potentially uh, can can really lower their cost of access 
to, to this kind of investments. It, when, when, uh, when you are approached by a, a company that is already listed, has already, uh, sorry, has already issued uh, securities, uh, bankable securities on a CSD, uh, has already a, a trail, a, an information trail that is auditable uh, and uh, is, is embedded into the uh, into the infrastructure of the exchange uh, is a much easier and much better uh, experience when when you talk to the to the founders of the company that's very interesting actually that there's several things you've said there that really need to be highlighted max i mean first of all and i i love it i'm delighted to hear it because you mentioned how actually the traditional buy side well we know that's going to take some time for them to really get into something like the private equity business but clearly you can help hold their hand and give them a public style experience which makes it easier for them and therefore the valuation services become interesting as they do on the private side and i love the fact that you're getting positive buy-in from the venture capital business because some might think they would be reluctant to participate whereas it strikes me that actually this is a way to compress the costs for everybody along the side of the value chain and therefore offer something well what exchanges do providing an opportunity for all human life to get involved in investing in markets so as a matter of interest you said you were a wholesale exchange does that mean you run to like wholesale tick rules? Do you have to ha invest in a minimum of whatever, 100,000 Swiss francs or 100,000 euro or dollar of product? Or is it just the fact that to get into the membership and to be a participant, a counterparty, you have to be an institution? In order to be a, a member, you have to be an institution. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, the uh, usual rules apply, uh, regulatory capital, uh, the usual uh, approvals by the by the authorities, and again, in that respect, uh, we 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 are very much uh, a traditional exchange. But again, it's done because we want to maintain a certain consistency, and uh, and because uh, uh, again, at the moment we have uh, we are addressing predominantly uh, the uh, the uh, the institutional market. So th that's then the consequence is, is that. Fabulous. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your likes this evening. Thank you very much for your questions as well. It's been really, really interesting discussing developing digital assets here with Max Butti. So, so Max, it is fascinating. It's a whole new institutional market that you're hoping to bring out towards the world. You are in your own way playing your own little capital market revolution here in every possible way, day by day. But nonetheless, I've got to ask you the crux question that we ask every viewer every guest at the end of the show where do you think the capital market revolution goes next well uh in the metaverse that's where it's going uh i think and this is very personal uh i think that uh, the uh, metaverse uh, will develop uh from uh what it is at the moment uh a lot of a lot of people think that the metaverse is just for kids and gamers actually it couldn't be further from the truth is a physical is a is a is a is a is a place out there that doesn't have physical properties but nevertheless exists it's a world uh, and uh, in that world there are uh, people who, who operate and they're not so naive or uh, or or uh, or uh, wrapped up into in into these virtual worlds to 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 confuse them with the real world. They know exactly they are not uh, real. However, that they don't have physical properties. However, they are, they don't see them uh, as less important than uh, the uh, the real world. Uh, in in the metaverse, you are, already have factories who make artifacts and goods that are consumed in the metaverse. Ideally, there could be an exchange that operates only in the metaverse and lists only companies that exist in the metaverse in the metaverse. Uh, they, there will be uh, a need for capital markets in the, meca, met, in the meta world, uh, in, the, in the metaverse. So it's probably a far-fetched prediction, but this is, uh, this is where I think it's going. And it's going to be a lot more democratic. It's going to be a lot more fun as well. Uh, but 
uh, this is where I think it's going. Well, certainly anything, if you've been a cryptocurrency investor, would be a lot more fun than the last three weeks in crypto land. So maybe we all need to be in the metaverse if you've been holding a lot of block Bitcoin recently. Of course, if you're on the blockchain or you're in digital assets, you may not have been noticing the same pain because you're building the markets of the future with the likes of the Swiss Digital Exchange. Thank you very, very much, Max Butti, Head of Equities at SDX, the Swiss Digital Exchange, a subsidiary of S6, the Swiss Exchange itself. It's been fascinating to talk to you this evening. I want to say thank you very, very much to all those who have made their comments during the course of this evening. Peter Second, Liam Moore, HV, Simon Huckle. We won't make it into the metaverse by next week, ladies and gentlemen, but who knows, we might be coming soon from a virtual place near you. However, we're going to be talking to the fabulous Mac Gill next week, and we're going to be discussing delivering new parish technology, technology for the worlds of exchanges and markets, whether in the metaverse, in the legacy exchange business, or indeed across the digital markets. My name is Patrick L. Young. I want to say thank you once again to Max Butti for being such an interesting guest this evening, coming from the cutting edge, innovative Swiss digital exchange. Of course, Switzerland, land of innovation, not merely in watches, but the people who bought you. Well, amongst other things, the Alinghi, the Alinghi yacht that won the America's Cup quite incredibly a number of years ago, amongst many other facets too. Thanks very much to the production team this evening, Bat and Jamil, Herminia and Jake. My name is Patrick L. Young. Catch the water cooler of the Bourse Business Exchange Invest Daily in your inbox. Ping us on social media and we'll set you up with a free trial if you'd like to watch that. My name is Patrick L. Young. With my guest this evening, Max Butty, we've been discussing developing digital markets. Thanks for watching. Catch up next week. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's been a pleasure.